Adolf Martens, um, truly a hero for all of us, um, not just steel makers and, and metallurgists, but engineers in general. Looking back, these are some of his sketches, and uh, without the power of microscopes and micrography, excuse me, uh, metallography, we were able to look at things, but maybe not share them as easily. And so all of these beautiful, beautiful sketches from his notebooks, including these first observations, it's these repeating plate-like geometries and, and their habit planes that we understand so well and bear his name. Um, but perhaps more notably, um, he was one of our first proponents of quantitative testing. Okay, so he spent a large portion of his time in the laboratory devising mechanical systems to test mechanical properties of interest, um, measuring, weighing, um, quantifying observations from the microscope. And indeed, um, in addition to building a very strong research laboratory, was the first to develop some handbooks and had this really crazy idea at the time that instruments in different labs should maybe give the same results. And so developed a whole series of handbooks for calibration of, of mechanical test um, uh, trying mechanical testing equipment that really uh, drove a lot of what we're doing today. Okay. Um, of course, what we can see with our eye, um, the metallography is just a part of what we use to understand what happens within a metal. And as we understand more and more that there are different phases, we needed better tools for understanding how they evolved. And so the work of Floris Osmond and his very dilatation experiments to understand the formation of, of phases within steels. Okay, again, very much driven toward the economics and the purposefulness of steels in society and steels in, in manufacture, led the way for a number of subsequent observations. Of course, his early observations about the rearrangement of carbon in, in steel were eh, kind of wrong, but he put us in the right path, I think. Um, this is just a, a wonderful uh, phase diagram that I had to share with you. Uh, and cementite, we see uh, perlite and ferrite and, 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 and graphite in this wonderful chart from the, from the turn of the century. Um, I, as we began to understand how things worked, we again could pull things toward purposeful applications, and here, again, with the, um, with the wars at hand, realized those big, heavy cannons were also doing tremendous damage to naval ships. Um, this work done out of the Washington Navy Yard was quite promising, but you have to look at how um, challenging it must have been to develop that microstructure on the left. Uh, if you take a look at the micron marker, you'll see that the plate thickness is on the order of 10 inches. So we, so we had a long ways to go. I'm not going to spend too much time with the history lesson. I think you're all aware of electron microscopy and the things that it allows us to do. I toss this up just to show how, how early some of the very first systems were developed and, and how long it took before we had commercial systems available to us in 1965. And of course, we can do beautiful things with electron microscopy. We can see things we never could before. And we can resolve, we can resolve atoms. We can see phases that we've theorized. We can very, very clearly understand um, and control z-factor observations and see individual grains, strains, grain boundaries. Um, tremendous, tremendous capabilities in here some uh, work coming out of Hamish Frazier's lab. But while we were advancing our experimental techniques, of course, you know, computers were working their way through as well. And this is just a plot against um, the amount of, calc the number of calculations per $1,000 that we could run at any given time. And it tracks very nicely with Moore's law. Um, and of course, we understood what to do with that as, as good scientists and engineers and all of the 
um, DFT and early quantum mechanical calculations and continue to advance um, work to understand how that influences phase development and thermal stability, giving us insight into how we can best manipulate metals of all sorts. And, and really starting to understand how that affects processing and the c control of our, our structures and what we have at, at our control. But until, until just recently, until perhaps you know, this, this century, we hadn't had the tools to really put these things together. And I, I want to pause and just spend a moment to think about this as a very important inflection point. And so the ability to incorporate um, in a very quantitative way and to use our individual models of various physical phenomena that describe what we understand and what, are, what are, you know, our, our forefathers understood about what it be, needs to be a metallurgist, what we have at our control and processing, why we want to arrive at a particular structure and the properties that we can control and where we take them. We can work this um, wonderful um, diagram forwards or backwards, and it's a sim simplified version of something that uh, Professor Olson would deliver. But it's the way we think as metallurgists, okay, as material scientists. And being able to incorporate those in real time, right, and to be able to not just run serially, but to take advantage of the dynamic coupling in, in our models and our tools that reflect the dynamic coupling in real life is, is a huge moment, a huge moment, I think. Um, I think the accelerated insertion of materials, we spent a wonderful day yesterday talking about how that gave us the opportunity to pull these tools together. And it, and it wasn't about advancing a material system, but it was about doing our work and developing a methodology that's both rigorous and exploitative of these tools that we have. How do we, how are we more rigorous in our computations? How are we more rigorous in our experiments by using computations? And how do we put that together to be purposeful and to deliver the technologies we need to deliver more timely, more precisely, with greater confidence as we look toward um, new capabilities we have in additive manufacturing? These tools are essential, absolutely essential. This is a quick uh, reminder for those who, who haven't heard me talk before. Um, this is from the, the DARPA AIM program with Steve Wax and Leo Cristalu. And the idea was, again, to take advantage of the tools that we understood for predicting various properties, to integrate them, and then to map the results against something that our colleagues who are design engineers can understand. Here, uh, mapping local properties, pixel by pixel, against the CAD drawing, okay? And so we understand that the properties in, as a result of this forging and heat treatment are going to vary based on the precise location you're investigating. That may or may not be true to many of our engineering colleagues who look at a metal as a singular chunk of, of gray stuff, right? And so how do we add that complexity in a way that's useful? It all comes back to that complexity problem. Uh, we understood from that program that we could do things more intelligently, that we could do things very quickly, that we could take time out, and oh, by the way, that we could s deliver um, better performance. And here, um, some factors of merit in terms of weight reduction and burst speed, improvements of over 20%, and the understanding of where fracture may arrive, I think we're pretty convincing for moving forward. This, program, of course, was followed on by, by one that's near and dear to my heart, um, the carefully chosen title, The Dynamic, right? Again, capturing that dynamically um, coupled mechanisms associated with uh, microstructural evolution, whether it's from our processing attempts or from operational environments and use conditions, to understand what the microstructure has to offer, what we can control, and how we can control it. And again, after we understood that ICME, or ICME, was effective, how do we modify our more foundational research so that it's ICME ready and we can take advantage of those tools and those integration schemes? Um, so we, we understood also that three-dimensional um, characterization and really the quantification, right? Um, 
after our hero Martins is outrageously important. And this is one of the products of that program I think we should all be uh, proud of. And it's a, a tri-beam electron microscope. Okay, so there's a femtosecond laser that's ablating the surface. And then we can inquire um, in the SEM and build a serial section. And we can do that relatively quickly now. Okay, we can generate a lot of data. And we can look at very large sections. But I think the, the most important part is that now we have very quantitative descriptive information for each of those grains, their orientations, their interfaces, the way that they grow. And, you know, it's ground truth, okay? It's ground truth. It's the information that we have that we can use as an input for the models that we use to try to understand things as they happen. And, you know, if you have such ground truths and, and you have a good idea of what's happening, and you have a really, really good mathematician with you, perhaps you can generate um, statistically equivalent microstructures of these relevant volume elements that can be used in silico to predict the effects of our processing or the life that we engender into these materials that we put out into the world. Um, the program also um, did some really interesting things in in terms of telling us what we know and what we don't know. Uh, this, this is an old um, image, and uh, forgive me, um, but the image in the upper left is, is not digital data, right? It's, it's a digital image, and it's, it's very pretty. The digital data that's behind it is the voxel by voxel information about what each grain is, its composition, its orientation to its neighbors, the interface between it and its neighbor, and in this case, how it grew voxel by voxel in real time while being studied in, um, by tomography by Eric Lawston, Rizzo. Um, beautiful, beautiful work, but again, it gives us ground truth. And so when we take the before image, very, very carefully dissect 